Good morning. Nothing like hearing a mighty fortress sung at Believer's Chapel on Reformation Sunday. That was beautiful. Uh, thanks for that. We get accused sometimes of not communicating uh, very well. I think it's unjustified, but uh, Dan will be back. Uh, next uh, Sunday, he'll resume our study in the Gospel of John. I'm looking forward to that. I know that you are uh, as well. So we look forward to having Dan back uh, next week. This was planned, a two-week uh, break for him. And so uh, he, he tunes in. So Dan, we miss you. I look forward to you coming back. But our scripture reading this morning, the one I've chosen, is a very familiar passage out of the Gospel of Luke in the ninth chapter. It's the account of the feeding of the 5,000. So I would ask you to please turn in your Bibles to Luke 9 and verse 10. Those of you who attend the adult Sunday school class will recognize that I am picking up where we left off the last time in our ongoing study of Luke's gospel. Jesus has uh, attracted a significant number of uh, admirers and would-be followers as he's made his way throughout the region of Galilee, a uh, teaching tour primarily, but because of his compassion for the people, it's turned into a platform of sorts for the display of his miraculous power to heal. And even overcome demonic forces. And the 12 disciples that he has chosen have been granted a front row seat, we might say, uh, for all that he had been doing, but they'd also been granted by him the opportunity of joining in with him in his ministry. And in the previous passage, in the first two verses of chapter 9, he had called them together and specifically uh, given to them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. And so now as uh, we begin our reading in the 10th verse, uh, here comes their report uh, back to him along with what ensues. Beginning in verse 10, when the apostles returned, they gave an account to him of all that they had done. Uh, taking them with him, he withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida. But the crowds were aware of this and followed him. And welcoming them, he began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of healing. We see that repeated throughout the Gospels that Jesus was preaching about the kingdom of God and at different times we've talked about that what, it, what that meant. At other times it just says he was preaching uh, the Gospel. I'll address that a little bit in, in, in the message. So he began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and then curing those who had need of healing. And now the day was ending and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away, that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside and find lodging and get something to eat, for here we are in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless perhaps we go and buy food for all these people for there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down to eat in groups of about 50 each. They did so and had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them and kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. And they all ate and were satisfied and the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up, 12 baskets full. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and our time together. Uh, let's pray. One of the great themes of the Bible is the sufficiency of God to meet every circumstance of a believer's life. We see it throughout in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
Abraham and Sarah were, to, were too old to have a child, but God had promised them a son to be born to them, and so, uh, so Sarah became pregnant, and Isaac uh, was born. Uh, God had promised it to them, and he proved sufficient to the promise. Uh, Joseph uh, was abandoned by his brother, sold into slavery, and carted off to a faraway land with no reason to hope for a pleasant end. But the Lord lifted him up to unimaginable heights of power and wealth and providentially reunited him with his father and his brothers and made him their savior of sorts. Moses was too slow of, sli of, of speech to lead his uh, people and be their spokesman. Uh, David, too young to deliver Israel. Uh, Jeremiah possessed the shortcomings of both. He was both young and unable to speak, yet he became a mighty and powerful, courageous prophet of God. In 2 Kings chapter, chapters 4 and 5, the prophet Elisha is portrayed in a series of brief vignettes demonstrating the power God had instilled in him, uh, providing a bottomless jar of precious oil for an impoverished widow, raising the Shunammite woman's dead son to life, curing the Aramean Naaman's leprosy, and then one more, uh, strikingly similar to what the disciples experienced with the feeding of the 10,000. A man brought Elisha a gift, a, a gift of 20 uh, loaves of bread and some ears of grain. And upon receiving it, Elisha gave the bread to his attendant and he told him, give this to the people that they may eat. But he objected. What, will I set this before a hundred men? Sounds familiar after our reading this morning. Uh, Elisha persisted, however, and spoke to him again, Give it to them, for thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left over. So he set it before them, and they ate, and they had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. As I said, the miracle was astonishingly similar to that in our passage today, and the lesson the same, the enormity of the need is not affected by the meagerness of the supply when God's loving power is promised. It was a lesson Jesus was at pains to impress upon his 12 disciples. They had personally witnessed one miracle after another the Lord performed, and, and armed with uh, his power and his authority, they had just ventured out on their own and experienced how the Lord could use even them uh, with all their obvious deficiencies to miraculously heal diseases and, and overcome demons. But no matter how many miracles they saw, they never seemed to have expected another. Surely uh, we can relate uh, to this weakness of faith in the heat of the battle when life's trials and afflictions uh, come upon us and anxieties uh, mount, uh, weak human faith struggles. It is hard. It's hard. No matter how faithful God has proven to be to us in the past, how often he has heard our prayers and rescued us, when that next crisis looms or comes crashing down upon us, we tend to despair our faith lags, our memories too, and the dreadful anxiety born of faithlessness leads us dashing off in every direction but the sure one in order to meet the moment. The sure remedy is to bring the matter before the throne of grace where Jesus uh, superintends the affairs of our lives and find in him the compassion and perfect provision for every need. Our passage uh, beckons us that way and gives us, uh, quantitatively at least, the greatest miracle of compassion and sufficiency Jesus did. The only one besides uh, his resurrection that all four Gospels 
uh, contain. The groundwork for it was laid in the episode leading up to it. Jesus' ministry in Galilee was drawing to a close. Uh, soon they would move to the coastal cities of Tyre and Sidon and on to Caesarea Philippi and then eventually down to Judah and up to Jerusalem itself where, where Jesus would finally fulfill his, his destiny. Uh, Galilee had been given every opportunity to receive their Messiah who had come and to welcome him as the long ago, as the one long ago promised by the prophets and in their scriptures. They had heard him uh, teach with great authority. We see this repeated over and over in the Gospels. They marveled at the authority with which he taught. They had seen him perform supernatural signs and displayed loving compassion wherever he went, but they had not heeded his call to repent and believe his message of uh, the kingdom. They were obtuse in their unbelief, and, and now their season of opportunity was drawing to an end. The Lord knew where he was going, and he knew what he was leaving behind uh, after his departure, he would have need of agents, of ambassadors, empowered by his spirit to continue his work. That was the purpose behind him uh, sending out uh, the twelve in the previous verses to discover how they could fulfill his commission of them when armed with his power and authority. And now Luke picks back up uh, the story in verse 10 of chapter 9. Uh, when the apostles returned, they gave an account to him of all that they had done. A simple statement. Uh, Luke obviously wasn't looking to embellish the account they gave, but we can imagine there was quite a bit of excitement among them. Uh, being human, I can imagine them uh, talking over each other, uh, excitedly reporting on all that they had been able to do in the strength of Christ's command. This was the same 12 who would later, uh, you know, argue among themselves about who would have the higher rank in the kingdom when the kingdom came. So there was likely a bit of one-upmanship uh, going on here. So, but they'd been out in the field, so to speak, for more than a few days, staying in the homes of people they didn't know, people that would take them in, uh, traveling from one town to another, ministering in every place uh, in the way that they had seen the Lord minister. Uh, that's a, fat a fatiguing uh, exercise, as anyone will tell you has been on this kind of mission trip uh, before. So Luke describes in verse 10 how Jesus took them alongside and withdrew to a city called Bethsaida. Mark's account uh, relates that he suggested they come along to a secluded place and rest for a while because there were many people still coming and going and they did not even have time to eat, Mark says. So they went away in the boat to, to this secluded place by themselves. The city of Bethsaida was a new, newish city founded by Herod Philip on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And they must have made their way not into the city uh, proper, but to an unsettled locale nearby, for they will uh, soon object that they were in a, a desolate place and there was no place for them to go to get food to feed all these, these people. <clears throat> Rest is good. Uh, and Jesus knew that they, they needed it. I know some people who get a little too much rest. They have uh, proverbs especially crafted uh, for them. Uh, but sometimes uh, Christians can get caught up in the mentality that uh, to rest is to be uh, lazy, to be selfish, uh, to shirk our duties. The Lord, though, 
recognize the need for toiling servants of every kind and even for laborers in the gospel or perhaps especially for laborers in the gospel to take time to rest. But on this day, rest was not to be for Jesus and his, uh, and his companions. The, the, the crowds of people apparently saw them slipping away in the boat and, and many of them figured out where they were uh, headed and, and, and whether because of contrary winds on the sea or for whatever reason, many of the multitude were able to reach the spot on foot uh, before the boat with Jesus and the disciples even landed so that when the Lord uh, went ashore, he was uh, greeted not with remoteness and rest, but with a horde of eager Galileans. John's gospel states that they had come because they saw the signs which he was performing on the sick. Uh, some of them were needy then in that way, uh, but no, others no doubt had come for the show. There were a lot of those. We're not told how the weary 12 felt about the surprise greeting, though we can speculate because we're very much like them. But the compassionate Jesus, uh, Luke says, welcomed them. Uh, the need for physical rest gave way to the need for a greater rest. For Jesus, the people uh, were the primary thing. He had a mission, and he had a plan to work it out among the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as he often referred to them. But sometimes things happened. Uh, circumstances uh, would bring him face to face with people for whom, at least in his humanity, he, he had not planned in his agenda. And when that happened, Jesus invariably reacted in the way we see here, as Luke uh, touchingly described it, I mean, as Mark touchingly uh, described it in Mark 6, 34, when he saw them, he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had come into the world as God's son, uh, bound by a mission he would not fail to complete, one formulated in divine wisdom before the foundation of the world. It was aimed at God's own glory, but also conceived out of God's compassionate love for lost sinners. To, to use Jesus' own language, his father had given that company of sinners to him in order that he might redeem them and, and ensure eternal life for them. If we were reminded last Sunday out of Psalm 65 that God is good and that God is great, now we have the opportunity to observe that God's Son is good and He's almighty. So Luke uh, describes how Jesus saw things differently than his disciples. As Alexander McLaren wrote, Christ's heart felt more lovingly than ours because his eye saw deeper. And his eye saw deeper because his heart felt more lovingly. So he began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and, and curing those who had need of healing. In other words, he stuck to the same theme as he proclaimed in every place, the same message he had given his disciples to preach, that God's rule was a, a certain and sovereign rule because it was founded uh, not on the futile efforts of weak human accomplishment, but upon the action of God in his son, whose son Jesus is. It was a spiritual kingdom uh, meant to be shared by spiritually pure inhabitants who could attain to that only through repentance and faith in God's Son, yielding the forgiveness of their sins. It belonged to the poor in spirit, uh, to those who mourned over their sin and would trust in Him as the only path to forgiveness and salvation. And this poor, deluded crowd had been misled by their negligent shepherds, uh, led to believe that Messiah was going to come as a great political leader, and he was going to uh, release them from their bondage to uh, the Roman uh, Empire. 
uh, such a physical, earthly kingdom would come, but not until all of God's sheep were successfully brought into the fold. And so the compassionate Jesus told them about that kingdom, and as he was confronted with those who uh, had need of healing, his sympathy for them burst out and led him to impart his divine power in healing them. Well, the Lord and his disciples had probably arrived at their destination sometime that uh, morning. And so for the remainder of the day, uh, the hours passed as he ministered to them. And then as the day was ending, as Luke describes it in verse 12, the, the 12 came up to him and, and delivered an advisory. That's what I call it. It's an advisory. The day was ending, uh, says Luke. Uh, sunset was the normal time of the day when they'd have their evening meal. And, it, and sunset at this time of the year was probably around 6 p.m., that meant likely that by this time it was after four o'clock or so in the afternoon and minds would naturally turn to, you know, plans. We do this every day. <laughs> what are we going to eat uh, tonight? And for some, where will they spend the night? We don't do that, but we do talk about what we're going to eat. And that's, that was on people's minds. So some of the disciples approached the Lord and they said, send the crowd away uh, that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside and find lodging and get something to eat for here we are in this desolate uh, place. It was a brash way to speak uh, to Christ. Uh, and we can't blame it on the, the you know, well, in the Greek, what it's, uh, we can't blame it on that. It, it, this is... This is what uh, they said. It was spoken as a, a command. Send the crowd away. Look at where we are. We'd be irresponsible to not act now. Uh, heady with vainglory, uh, maybe, uh, coming down from the spiritual high of their, their mission trip, their newfound confidence veered into impertinence to think that Jesus somehow had not calculated the for the need ahead of time. In, in point of fact, he had. In John 6, uh, John describes Jesus the moment when he saw the crowd beginning to coalesce around them. He said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? Uh, John wrote that he was saying this to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. He knew it already. He already knew this was not at all the problem that his disciples were making it out to be. Their evaluation of the situation was limited, to say the least. Their vision uh, was impaired. What they could see, however, were thousands and thousands of people who had not made preparation to spend this amount of time in such a desolate place. And it's telling uh, Luke waits until verse 14 to tell us how many people uh, were there, about 5,000 5, men there. And he specifies, here we do look at the Greek, we, he specifies by the Greek word he uses that he's referring to adult males, 5,000 adult males. And so we extrapolate out from there uh, because Matthew, in his account, says that that, that was beside the whim, besides the women and, and the children. So we extrapolate out from there to estimate that there could have been up to, you know, we've all heard figures, but 15,000 people maybe, 12,000, 15, 18, up to 20,000 mouths to feed. So the disciples thought that they were taking into account all the possible solutions, but again, they forgot the most important. But he had already formulated the solution, so he responded, you give them something to eat. You give him something to eat. He was emphatic. I mean, he said it in that way. That's how the text reads. You give them something to eat. This is a situation, the solution for which 
I'm assigning to you. They must have looked at each other in confusion, beginning to think a little more deeply, perhaps, about resources. They could rush to find the closest uh, market, but that would take forever. And besides, as Philip would point out, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to see, receive a little. A denarius was, had the value of about a day's uh, wages for a laborer. So however we calculate what that would be, the short answer is they didn't have that kind of money. They didn't have that kind of money. And you notice Philip's use of that thematic word, uh, sufficient. 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them. What could be sufficient? Well, what if we pull all the resources that we find from all these thousands and thousands of people and put them together, uh, maybe we can make a meal out of that. And you know, an integral part of the incident of the feeding of the 5,000 is that Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, uh, came up to Jesus to hand him uh, those resources. Some poor, innocent little boy had somehow been coerced to give up the sack lunch that he at least had the foresight uh, to pack. Uh, two, uh, five loaves of bread and two fish doesn't sound necessarily as, as piddling uh, fair. So students of the passage uh, speculate that what, what that really was was uh, little small biscuit type pieces with, with, with little uh, uh, dried fish like sardine like fish in which case we question the little boy's choice of uh, lunch but uh, the point of it is that it was a lunch packed only for a little boy. It was for a little boy. I see little boys here. You don't eat as much as big people do, or some of you do. Andrew's conclusion reinforces that. What are these for so many people? The disciples by now have exhausted their resources, they think, uh, the inventory of supply is, as I, Howard Marshall, put it, ludicrously inadequate. Never miss an opportunity to use the word ludicrous or ludicrously. <laughs> ludicrously inadequate. And there's no time to execute a, a grocery run of the scale that would be necessary. Their, their possible solutions are totally insufficient. And it's then that the way is prepared for a provision of plenty beyond their capabilities. They had forgotten somehow about Jesus. Recent events ought to have prepared them for this moment. They themselves had access to his power, though they had read, readily forgotten that. And the Lord himself, just this day, uh, had just spent hours uh, teaching and miraculously healing the sick. He was standing in their very midst. And I don't know about you, but I think I'm related to them. McLaren wrote that they were our true brethren in their failure to grasp the full meaning of the past and to trust his power. And Jesus commanded them, you give them something to eat was meant to bring out the clear recognition of the smallness of their supply. As we read and study this this morning, many of you I know for the umpteenth uh, time, uh, there are important lessons here for us. Assignments are given to us. Challenges to our faith appear around every bend. Duties are thrust upon us so that we may discover anew how impotent we are to fulfill them. As McLaren observed, the best preparation of his servants for their work in the world is the discovery that their own stores are small. Christ's disciples have stumbled into the perfect place, and now they will discover 
as the Apostle Paul would later, that the one who was even then in their midst was able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. But first, the table must be spread, and so uh, verse 14 uh, portrays uh, the Lord giving instruction to his disciples, have the people sit down in groups of about 50 each. Uh, Mark's version adds some detail in, in Mark chapter 6. He records how uh, they sat down in rows of hundreds and fifties, and that he directed them to sit down in the green grass. That would have been more comfortable, uh, certainly, and the groupings would make it easier to, to serve uh, the, 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 the crowd, to serve the non-existent food to uh, the crowd. What, pro what Mark was probably noting that Luke thought unimportant was that there were actually a hundred groups of 50 uh, male heads of families, which would equate to the 5,000 total figure put forth. Some communication uh, had to have taken place between the disciples and the people in order for them to comply, and it had to have perplexed both the disciples and them to be seated that way with uh, no obvious uh, source of food for them uh, to, to be served. It'd be like going into a restaurant, and you look around, and there's no wait staff, and there's nobody in the kitchen either. But then comes the miracle in verses 16 and 17 that would underscore the sufficiency of Christ against all odds to provide for the needs of people upon whom he chooses to have compassion. After the people were seated, uh, Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, and he who was both a man and God pronounced the traditional uh, Jewish uh, blessing on the food and then began to break them into pieces and distribute the bread and the fish uh, to the disciples, just as a typical uh, Jewish father would do with his family. He, he did it in the most natural way, uh, just as anybody there would have expected. Uh, Luke says that he kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. And of course, you know, they all ate, uh, all the thousands and thousands of them, and they were all satisfied. And when they were uh, finished, the disciples picked up the leftover uh, food with baskets, and there were 12 baskets uh, full. How he did it is not uh, explicitly set forth, but the tenses of the verbs uh, help to explain there in verse 16. Look there, uh, blessed and, and broke are both in that familiar aorist uh, tense that indicates a single action, just one action. But the verb he gave is in the imperfect tense, indicating a continuous, uh, repeated action, which is why many of the translations uh, have what my translation has. That they render it, he kept giving. He kept giving until, until he determined he had given out enough. Again, <clears throat> he, he broke the bread and the fishes, it seems, one time. <clears throat> one time. Then he began the to distribute the pieces uh, to the disciples, uh, to take to the people. And he just kept giving uh, the bread and the fish. He would reach into his basket. I'm presuming he had some sort of container, a basket. He would reach into his basket and, and take out new pieces and, and hand them out. The disciples would make their way out into the crowd and, and serve the people and come back to him empty. and. Uh, then there would be more pieces of food in the Lord's hands to distribute. This was a miracle of divine creation, an introduction into time and space of wholly new matter. There's some controversy about that, but I believe that's what he was doing. He uh, specially fashioned and produced uh, food by divine power. The Apostle John you know, was one of those 12 disciples uh, there scurrying about amongst the people, John. And he would one day 
uh, began his gospel uh, by recounting that all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That would include uh, the bread and the fish that fed the, the 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000 was entirely in accord with his person and with his divine power. The same power that is available to all who belong to him, to all who call upon him in his grace to extend his hand full of mercy and love and compassion. We need nothing more. He is the all-sufficient one. As one of our teachers here once said, a little becomes a lot when the Lord's hands are on it. And all this helps to answer the question, we haven't talked about this, but Herod had a question at the end of the last section of, of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, who is this man about whom I hear all these things? That topic's going to come up soon. Well, the disciples had a role uh, this day. Uh, they had their role to play. Uh, we would not say that Jesus couldn't have done it without them, but we can and must say that he chose to do it through them. Verse 17 relates that all the thousands of people ate and were satisfied, and the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up, 12 baskets full. Jesus employed his 12 uh, disciples to bring satisfaction to the hungry in the power of his strength. And each of them perhaps found his own satisfaction in the role that he played, which is to say that they found their satisfaction in him. They had been weak in faith. Oh, they had been weak, weak in faith. But at this moment, they could look up from their labor and know that God had been at work in their lives to use them for good and for his glory and that people had been blessed. That's a, a good feeling to experience and they did not deserve it, but God seems to enjoy working that way. The El Moody, a man whom God used mightily as his instrument once observed that we may easily be too big for God to use, but never too small. God doesn't need us to do his mighty works on earth. He can do whatever he desires. If he chooses, he can do it by fiat, by just saying the word, and it will be done. But he chooses to use us so that we might share in the joy of the work of the Lord, no matter how small or great that may appear to be. Richard Baxter was an English Puritan pastor and theologian who wrote well over 100 books. He was a prolific writer. I say well over 100. It might have been over 200. Some of you guys might know. But uh, he had a significant ministry within the church and really without the church in the late part, latter half of the 17th century. And as he neared the end of his days on earth, a friend meant to comfort him by reminding him of all the good work he had accomplished for the Lord throughout his ministry, and Baxter famously replied, I was but a pen in God's hand. That's what every true disciple is, a sinner saved by grace and then put to use by the Lord with all our imperfections. But Jesus is able to take our limited and totally inadequate abilities and give them back to us to serve his interests. He's able to make something out of nothing. Nothing is too impossible for him. Do you believe that? With his help, we may be made into servant conquerors in our homes, in our families, in the workplaces and neighborhoods, where we will spend our time uh, tomorrow and today. If you're here this morning and you have not trusted in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, uh, we invite you to do so and to become uh, his disciples.
Come to him for the forgiveness of your sins. He's able to make something out of you that will astonish you. But you must first discover that you are inadequate in yourself. Your sins have made you God's enemy. But he is a savior of sinners and has made provision for sin in the gift of his son. In the Gospel of John, I keep mentioning John's Gospel since I'm talking to you who may not know the Lord and perhaps are unfamiliar with the Bible. Uh, there's four Gospels. Uh, the Gospel of John is a favorite of many. We're studying it here uh, typically at this hour on Sunday mornings. And in that Gospel, John has this account also. Uh, and then he has a great discourse that follows his account of the feeding of the 5,000. And in that discourse, Jesus will say, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also, which I will give for the life of the world, is my flesh. The living bread was broken for us, voluntarily, on the cross, where Jesus bore the penalty for sin. If anyone is to truly live, he or she must partake of the bread of life. Believe in him, then. Allow him to do for you what you could never uh, do for yourself and enjoy the promise of eternal life. May God give you the grace uh, to do that. Well, let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for the gift of life in the bread of life. Uh, we're so grateful. Thank you that uh, our failures and inadequacies, though they technically have disqualified us, you've overcome them in the person of your son because he took our place to bear the penalty we deserved upon the cross. And it is our prayer, as always, that if there are here any who have not trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sins, that you would move in their hearts. It's your work, and we pray for that. And bless us as we leave. May we give honor uh, to you in all that we do. Bless our observance of the Lord's Supper as we break the bread that reminds us of his uh, death on the cross. We pray in his name. Amen.